Uh, good uh, morning, um, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us at the launch of the Signia Health Innovation Global Equity Fund. Um, it is a new product, and I know that there's quite a lot of interest um, in the fund. Um, today, I'm joined um, by Nikki Davidson, who is the actual portfolio manager of the fund. And so the presentation will take kind of three parts. You know, I'll talk for a little bit introducing the theme. And then um, Nikki will take over to talk, uh, to talk about the portfolio. And then I'll talk about Oxford Sciences Innovation for those that have not heard the story yet. Um, so we will be switching between the screen sharing a little bit. So it's a little bit less smooth than if one presented the entire presentation. But I'm hoping that you get all the value that you need out of it. So um, thank you once again. And on that note, let's start uh, the actual presentation. So I think we can all acknowledge that things will never be the same after COVID-19. And it's not only COVID-19, but I think that you know, COVID-19 has brought to the fore the fragility of the healthcare system provision worldwide. And it's probably not the last pandemic that we will see in a lifetime. You know, from an economic perspective, obviously it has been a global disaster. I think we all know that we are not going to see some amazing V-shape um, recovery because you know this pandemic has hit every fundamental of macroeconomy and it, most importantly it has hit the consumer and consumer spending and consumer behavior so everyone is poorer and is feeling poorer um, you know the recovery is going to be very slow we have seen what the rent has done I don't think we are going to see much rent strength going forward we have seen downgrades of our credit rating we are likely to see more down, downgrades going forward and I'm not even going to talk about you know the various other corrupt type activities that have emerged uh, which have brought out the worst in human nature um, from a fiscal, fiscal perspective, um, worldwide, governments are going to look for money uh, following the unprecedented quantitative easing programs that we have seen. Governments deploy in the US, in, um, the, in Europe, um, as well as to a limited extent in South Africa. And it's, uh, you know, undoubtedly, um, they will be looking at the wealthy. And when I talk about the wealthy, I am not talking about people who are worth millions and millions of rands. You know, in the South African context, it's literally anyone uh, whose salary is probably around 800,000 per annum would be regarded as wealthy. Um, median salary in South Africa, incidentally, is 3,500 rand. So that just positions you. I suspect that absolutely everyone listening to this presentation is in the top 1% of um, the, the wealth population of, of South Africa. So we will all be affected by uh, wealth redistribution and higher taxation. Um, I think volatility is here to stay for a while. Um, and hence, the only antidote to volatility is diversification. Um, I've had some questions ahead of this presentation, in particular questions on Regulation 28, prescribed assets. You know, I'm, I'm very aware of the fact that the government right now, and of course, you know, that is subject to change, is looking at amending the regulation, not to be prescriptive, but rather to lift the investment limits on unlisted investments, so as to mobilize investments into infrastructure projects. Of course, if those investments are not mobilized and they are un unlikely to come from individuals, then we might see some form of prescription. But, you know, I know that prescription right now is not on the table. You know, I've also had a question on that note about living annuities and certainly in the South African context, living annuities, I would be looking at maximizing my offshore exposure right now and looking at the themes and the sectors that are likely to benefit from this pandemic. Uh, we have already seen asset price dislocation, oil price at zero at one stage, gold prices shooting through the roof, share prices are all over the place and in particular are not reflective of what is happening um, in the economy itself. And then obviously the spotlight on healthcare. Um, governments worldwide have become acutely aware of the inadequacy of healthcare provision and also the impact it has, not only on 
broader population, but also in terms of inequality within a population. And that's true both of emerging markets and developed markets. And that really talks to the theme of um, how you should look at investing going forward. So the next slide is a slide that you know I didn't uh, make up for this presentation. I actually used it last year for um, Singularity University presentation. And this is really the way we view the future of investing. This future has actually emerged and arisen much sooner than we expected uh, because of this pandemic. And obviously we did not envisage the pandemic, but we do believe that you know, investors globally going forward are going to look for low management fees, that passive investing where you have a much broader choice of geography, sectors and themes that you can invest in will continue to um, attract inflows. So in the United States, more than 50% of savings are already uh, being managed on a passive basis. In South Africa, that trend is growing. Uh, but with passive investing comes choice. You might be very surprised to know that passive investing is not vanilla, it is choice driven. And the fund we're launching to date talks to that choice. Um, we do believe that alternative investment strategies where the returns are not correlated to the market are going to become a lot more popular simply because, you know, people's um, tolerance of volatility in the markets is just not there. I think we are going to see a lot more corporate disappointments um, from the, in the listed space and hence uh, investors are looking for, you know, what, what alternatives are there. And th those alternatives usually exist in the understood space. Um, and then platform style virtual service delivery. And I think, you know, today's webinar is the best example of that. So this is how we saw the future last year and the future of investing and how we have structured Signia. Um, I think in terms of innovation and this fund being a you know, new and innovative offering. We do believe and we have tried to position Signia as a leader in innovation. Um, you know, probably our biggest innovation is the fact that we have always been believers in passive investing. Um, since the inception of Signia, we were the first passive manager to list a index tracking bond fund, listed property fund, balanced index tracking funds, a skeleton funds were also first in South Africa. And that belief in passive probably comes from, you know, my own past. Um, you know, I always go back to 1992, I think, when I started my career in investing and the very first portfolio I was tasked to manage together with one of the chief investment officers of Signia today, Ian Anderson, was an index tracking fund. Um, Signia Fourth Industrial Revolution Fund, uh, which invests in uh, companies with that kind of fourth industrial revolution focus, uh, which we launched in October 2016, is now ranked fourth out of 44 unit trusts in the global equity general category. Um, Signia Feng Plus Global Equity Fund, that's the fund that invests in the largest technology companies from your Facebooks, your Apples, Amazons, Netflix, Googles, is ranked third out of 54 unit, trust, uh, 54 unit trusts in its respective category with an annual, annualized return of 20.1% per annum. And the latest baby to the family launched in March 2020 is the Signia Oxford Sciences Innovation Fund. Um, um, which invests in unlisted investments and commercial spin-outs originating from Oxford University. Um, as much as I'm not going to talk about Signia Oxford Sciences Innovation Fund, we have included an allocation to shares in OSI in this portfolio as well, because um, it does talk directly to innovation in healthcare, which is the focus of the fund. So through investing in the um, Health Innovation Fund, you also get some exposure to OSI shares, which are a very, very scarce commodity. Um, so, you know, all of that um, expertise that we have built up from an investment perspective in looking at technology companies, emerging trends in technologies, emerging trends in life sciences, in healthcare, has brought us to this space, which is, you know, the natural progression um, with the launch of the Health Innovation Global Equity Fund. And this fund is, uh, focuses on the listed space predominantly, um, but does have a 3% allocation to OSI. 
as I've mentioned. So why have we focused on the healthcare sector as an investment opportunity? Apart from obviously we're living through a pandemic, so healthcare is at the for, uh, forefront of everyone's mind. Well, you know, we do believe that going forward, and you know, I'm not going to say that the pandemic is not a catalyst for our thinking. Of course, it is a catalyst. You know, we would be silly to say, you know, we came up with this out of nowhere. We've just become aware of everything that is happening around healthcare provision, inadequacy of healthcare provision, but also healthcare innovation. And we do believe that that innovation and focus on healthcare will drive global governments going forward and will remain a focus going forward long after this pandemic is over. Um, it is a sector with very limited availability in South Africa. So you really have very few choices to, to get exposure to any kind of healthcare focused companies. You know, you've got a couple of hospital groups in South Africa and you've got Aspen as a pharmaceutical company, but that's about it. So you do have to look offshore if you want healthcare exposure. Um, I think government focus worldwide has never been greater on healthcare, but what's important about it is that there is a lot of grant funding that is being made available by governments to, in particular, pharmaceutical companies for R&D, research and development. And what is so attractive from an investor perspective um, about grant funding is that the grant funding is effectively free money given to pharma companies to develop tests of vaccines um, and to innovate. So it is completely non-dilutive to shareholders. Um, we do believe that, uh, you know, in terms of healthcare, it's a very broad topic because it consists of so many different themes. So you have prevention, you have provision, you have medical devices, you have therapeutics, and all of those areas of healthcare provision are right now being disrupted by innovation and are being disrupted by technology. Um, and again, I'll show you some examples of that when I talk about OSI. Top performance, again, we will talk to that in a second, but healthcare has been one of the top performing sectors alongside technology. So hence the fourth industrial revolution thank fund, you know, that performance has not come out of nowhere. It is driven by investor demand and by the profitability of, of these companies. And then, you know, I always say in investing, never bet against the herd and never stand in the way of the herd. And top investors worldwide right now are flocking to healthcare innovation. So, um, you know, when, when Signia first invested in OSI shares, um, there was very little interest in OSI and we are talking mid 2019. At the moment, you couldn't buy a share in OSI for, you know, love of money. Um, the, the focus spotlight on anything to do with healthcare innovation has never been greater. And obviously with that focus, with that demand, comes value creation and come positive returns. Now, you know, as far as we are concerned, healthcare, in addition to being a profitable investment opportunity, is also a true impact investing opportunity because it addresses a need that has never been greater. Um, it addresses um, in economic and social in a, in equality and hardship. And obviously we are seeing masses and masses of people worldwide suffering through this because of inadequacy of healthcare provision. Um, healthcare also features in United Nations definition of ESG or impact investing, which talks about affordable education, healthcare, access to financial services and housing for all as being the four main themes or pillars of ESG investing in addition to climate change as the fifth pillar. We believe that um, you know, there are investment opportunities both in listed and unlisted space. Um, and the listed space is as exciting as the unlisted space. 
Um, healthcare is about a longer term time horizon as um, you know, any innovation in the life sciences space is much more capital intensive and time consuming. So you do have to have a longer term time horizon when investing, but there are some exceptional performance opportunities which have very low correlation to the volatility that you are experiencing in the market. Now, just for fun, some fun facts about healthcare which is definitely one of the mega trends um, worldwide. So um, the five largest pharmaceutical companies in the world combined, the market cap combined, outstrips the size of the entire JSC. So the JSC's market cap of all the companies listed on the JSC is amounts to 1.1 trillion US dollars. The top uh, five pharma companies stand at $1.3 trillion in terms of market cap. Isn't that a scary statistic, just in terms of what is available on the JSC to invest in? And then strip out NASPERS and it all goes pear-shaped very quickly. Profit margins of pharmaceutical companies range from 5% to 95%, depending on competition, market penetration, size of the market. Demographics, 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 aging population, particularly aging population in developed markets is what is driving demand for healthcare. So in Europe, 19.8% um, of the population in 2018 were over 65 years old. Um, and that is projected to reach 31% by 2000, year 2100. Now, you know, if you actually think about why did COVID-19 affect Europe from mortality perspective so much more than it affected Africa, well, here is one of the reasons. It's the age of the population. But the age of that population also talks to demand for healthcare services. In the United States, the median age has increased from in the 20s, 40 years ago, to 38 today. Um, so again, U.S. population is aging. 50% of U.S. population is over the age of 38. And those of you who are, who are listening know that actually the age at which you start looking at healthcare a lot more seriously is not 65, it's actually 40. It's downhill over 40, unfortunately. I wish they told me that when I was at university, but they kind of never do. Um, global healthcare spending is expected to grow by about 5.4% per annum. And in 2017, global healthcare spending already stood at $7.7 .7 trillion, which is projected to grow to 10.1 trillion by 2022. Um, the amount spent on healthcare research and development exceeds what is being spent in, on computing technology, innovation, and electronics and in 2018 stood at $170 billion a year. And then, most importantly, leading medical universities in the world, as ranked by Times Higher Education's World University Rankings data, are Oxford, Harvard, Cambridge, Imperial College of London, Stanford. Now, why do I put those universities there? Because Signia has opened offices in the UK, and uh, you know, if three of the leading universities are based in the UK, which basically means that we've got ease of access to research, ease of access to information. Um, I also sit on one of the advisory boards of Harvard University, so I do have access to Harvard um, as well. Um, and it is observing and looking at what is happening within those universities that actually sparks off investment ideas, sparks of thematics. You know, it's certainly what sparked off our investment in OSI. Now, health expenditure, this is a very scary statistic. Health expenditure is a percentage of GDP 2018 in different countries. 17% of US GDP is, um, you know, is, is made up of healthcare expenditure. That is a massive, massive number. So, you know, is this a theme that you can ignore in terms of structuring a well-diversified investment strategy, we really don't believe so. Because we also believe that these numbers are growing to grow and they are projected to grow. As again, talking to the demographics, as the populations age, as well as, as this pandemic um, highlights 
this kind of woeful inadequacy of healthcare provision worldwide. And then benefits. Let's talk about some positivity um, in terms of health, good healthcare provision, because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about deploying capital, investors' capital into companies that can do good, which can improve um, the general welfare of population uh, worldwide, emerging markets and developed markets. So right now, 43 days a year, or 43 days per person are lost to poor health uh, and premature death a year. Um, two to five times more than ex the, the uh, poor health care provision and health care costs have um, two to five times more impact on in terms of GDP um, than the COVID pandemic in its entirety. So the cost to the economy of poor healthcare provision is two to five times greater than what we are living through today. Um, and there are some very, you know, easy preventative measures that could be taken to, you know, to, to improve global health, to ensure that people feel better, that the current 65 year old feels like a 55 year old um, and 70% of the improvement in healthcare would come from preventative strategies rather than interventions. So things that happen before you become sick and that talks to environmental and behavioral and social interventions. So when one talks about investing in healthcare, one isn't just talking about interventions that come in the form of treatments. One is also talking about prevention, prevention from diseases happening uh, to begin with. Um, and with healthcare, we could increase global GDP, we could um, increase the well-being of global population, and you know there's a statistic which comes from McKinsey Global Institute survey which talks to the fact and you know some of you might say is this a positive but with good health care provision um, there would be more than uh, 230 million people on this planet by 2040. Okay, that, that might be a bit of you know, contentious because you might say we are already overpopulated, but hopefully by 2040, we would have populated Mars. So that's not an issue either. Now, what are the latest innovations in healthcare that we are in particular looking at? So, and, and that are most exciting. Um, so it's next generation genetic sequencing. And with genetic sequencing comes the ability to target healthcare provision and customize healthcare provision to every individual. 3D printed devices. So this is anything from joint replacement devices. Um, they come at lower cost and they can be again, completely customized um, to your particular, you know, skeletal shape if, if you're talking about hip replacement um, or, or anything that, you know, is kind of hardware related. Virtual reality is already being used to create simulated training environments for medical doctors, for nurses. Mm -hmm. Use of artificial intelligence in diagnostics. I'll give you an example of that when I talk about OSI. Um, similarly, point of care diagnostics, being able to, for instance, test for COVID-19 right there and then and get a result in five minutes, irrespective of where you are. Imagine what a difference it would make to current uh, COVID-19 pandemic, if you could literally test rapidly at wherever, you know, wherever the pe person is with a small diagnostic device. And again, I'll talk to that in the context of OSI. Biosensors and trackers, which are improving the ability of health providers to monitor your health and also for self-health monitoring. So, um, you know, you can um, feed your health data to, I mean, you know, the, the simplest are Garmin watches that everyone is, is wearing and, you know, the 10,000 steps that has become the new norm in uh, preventative healthcare provision. There will be more um, and more is being developed. 
in that space. There's a lot of innovation happening in the treatment of cancer and immunotherapies, which is very exciting. And then, of course, virtual medicine. Um, you know, in South Africa, we still have some outdated legislation, which means that virtual medicine is not a regulated activity. But worldwide, the fact that you can now consult with a medical doctor or with a specialist virtually, uh, particularly if you combine virtual medicine with something like point of care diagnostics or biosensors and trackers, which could feed data from you to your doctor directly without having to have physical interaction, I think is becoming the new norm. Um, and hopefully it will come to South Africa soon enough. We just need one piece of legislation to be amended. But again, very exciting concept. And, you know, this pandemic has brought the, the uh, or has accelerated the speed with which virtual medicine will take over. And then, you know, it always boils down to performance. So if you look at the performance of the MSCI World Healthcare Index relative to what we all know and all love and all invest in, which is the MSCI World Index, you can see the massive outperformance in the last 15 years by the healthcare sector of the broad world index. So can you really afford not to include healthcare um, as a, at least a divi diversifier in your overall investment strategy. And on that note, let me stop sharing my screen and hand over to Nikki Davidson, who is the portfolio manager, um, to take over the next section of the presentation and talk to you about the actual fund. Thank you, Magda. Um, good morning, everyone. As Magda mentioned, my name is Nikki, and uh, this morning I'm going to take you through some of the technical aspects of this exciting new fund that we're launching. Yeah, yeah so to start off with um, the objective of the fund, and I think Magda's painted a brilliant um, picture to kind of give you a sense of uh, what we're trying to do here. Um, but to sum it up, we're not only trying to target great performance in this fund, but also to generate a positive um, impact on society as well by investing in this uh, very, very important uh, sector for the health and well-being of the global population. So how we're going to go about doing this is um, investing in a core holding of listed global companies. Um, but as well as a small unlisted portion, which gives the fund uh, the opportunity to invest in some of those really exciting technologies that Magda mentioned, uh, things such as nanotechnology, biotechnology, to really get into the early stage of the development of um, those exciting innovations. So how are we going about doing this? Um, to start off, uh, the fund only invests in developed market, uh, sorry, I should say the, the core holding only invests in developed market equities. So those are equities uh, trading and domiciled on developed market exchanges. Then from within that very big universe, we identify those companies that are within the healthcare sector. Um, we do this using the global industry classification standard, very well known and um, well respected standard that is available. And from within that sector, we then identify the top 150. And um, our definition of top in this case is just based on size. So we use the free float adjusted market capitalization as a uh, determinant of size. Um, and those uh, holdings would be uh, weighted according to their size as well within the fund. Um, and actually taking a step back before we even get to identifying the top 150 companies that we include in our core holding, um, we put all eligible companies in the healthcare sector through an ESG screen. Um, for those not familiar with ESG, excuse me, um, ESG, I'm just referring to a company's environmental, social, and governance practices. Um, and there are many organizations out there that actually measure how companies are performing in terms of their environmental, social, and governance uh, actions. Uh, but the one that we have focused on and the one that we use in this fund to screen uh, eligible constituents is the Refinitiv ESG combined school grade. But we do use some other third party data just to verify and validate the outcomes that we get from Refinitiv. Um, there are a number of reasons why we like Refinitiv. Uh, just to highlight a few, we like that it is very data driven and not subjective at all. 
Um, we also like that it's, uh, the structure of the scoring methodology is such that it is very comparable between companies within an industry, which is great for our purposes of focusing on one particular industry. And then also the scoring is updated on a weekly basis, which uh, you know, often with these data providers, they maybe update once a year when a company releases their financial statements or their ESG report. But um, the definitive scoring actually updates on an ongoing basis based on new information that's available, information that's coming through um, in the news and the media. So this diagram gives you a little bit more detail on how that ESG scoring works to allow us to take a look under the hood at what we're using to screen out companies. Um, so they start off um, at the bottom here with a lot of data points that um, are combined into these category scores. So categories within the environmental, social and governance uh, pillars. Uh, those category scores are then weighted into a final overall ESG score. But that's not the score that we use um, in its entirety. We, we use the ESG combined score, which is the ESG score discounted by any controversies that there might be in the media. Um, so your overall ESG combined score um, is sort of your ESG score plus uh, an, another element that incorporates, uh, you know, if a company may be negatively impacted by some actions that it's taken on. Um, and that would be uh, identified within news articles and the media and the like. As an example of how this actually plays out, so this is just one of the companies that we identified that probably would have been included in the fund. Uh, it is large enough and actually its ESG score alone was above our threshold for inclusion. But due to all these ongoing controversies in the media, you know, its involvement in the opioid related lawsuits in the US, there are cases of fraud going on, um, and these are just a small sample of them. Um, because of this, they actually have the lowest controversy score uh, that is possible. So this um, took their overall combined score uh, way down and has resulted in its exclusion from the fund. Um, and that's how it operates. So we use this as an exclusion criteria. We don't weight uh, the constituents based on the ESG criteria. Um, but kind of those companies that are really lagging their peers in terms of their ESG performance are actually um, excluded altogether. Okay, so overall, this is what you can sort of expect the fund to look like. Um, we have the core component of those listed global stocks, and that's represented by the big circle there. Um, and then the smaller circle is the Oxford Sciences Innovation Company, um, which is a very exciting uh, investment opportunity. But I'm not going to touch too much on that now. I'll leave that to Magda, who's going to go um, in detail through that a bit later on. Um, but uh, I think Magda also mentioned this earlier. There's a lot of exciting stuff going on in the listed space as well. And uh, naturally, in light of the current pandemic, the, um, the listed sector has had to move and pivot quite quickly to address the current pandemic. So we thought it would be interesting to actually take a look at some of the companies within uh, the fund and to see what their involvement is uh, in light of the current pandemic. So we looked at three primary activities, uh, the development of a vaccine, the development of uh, treatments uh, for COVID-19, and the development of testing or testing kits to test for the virus. And you can see almost half of the fund's constituents are involved in some shape or form in addressing the pandemic, uh, a quarter of which are involved in the race to develop a vaccine. Some of those um, companies include Johnson & Johnson, um, AstraZeneca, who are working with the University of Oxford, um, BioNTech and Pfizer, who are working together, and they actually have four uh, leading candidates for the vaccine at the moment. Um, so, yeah, those are just to mention a few um, of what's in the fund. There are many more as well. Okay, and this, uh, the next few slides just give you a little bit more detail on what you can expect from the fund. Just to note that because of its very short history, this is based on the model um, portfolio. Um, so just to bear that in mind. So uh, we have 150 constituents in the fund. Uh, the combined market cap of those constituents is roughly 6.3 trillion US dollars. Um, and some of those big names uh, coming up again are the likes of Johnson & Johnson, United Health, uh, Roche Holdings, Merck, 
and um, the Office of Sciences Innovation Allocation as well, coming in at 3%. In taking a look at the geographic breakdown of your portfolio, um, so most of the companies are domiciled in the United States, but there's also quite a large allocation to Switzerland. And I don't know if you recall from the top 10 holdings, there were two very large Swiss companies included there, and that definitely up to the weight of Switzerland in your overall breakdown. And then lastly, um, looking at the sub-industry breakdown. So these are again classified according to the global industry classification standard. So most of the fund's constituents are involved in the pharmaceutical sector, followed by healthcare equipment, um, but there's also quite a large allocation to the biotechnology sector. So I hope that gives you a good picture of what to expect from the fund, um, but I'm going to hand over again to Magda to go through the company profiles and the very exciting Oxford Sciences Innovation. Okay, this is where it gets a little bit less elegant. Um, so let's talk about, you know, a little bit, and I'm only going to touch on some of the companies in the portfolio and their profiles, uh, just because, you know, we often hear about big brand names, but we don't know what they actually are involved in. So for instance, Johnson & Johnson is a US multinational company, 250 subsidiaries present in 60 different countries, distributes its products in 175 countries. And its main focus is the development of medical devices, pharmaceuticals, and then obviously consumer packaged goods, which we know them well for. But uh, well-known brands, uh, Band-Aid, Tylenol, you know, you cannot walk into any pharmacy in the U.S. without seeing shelves and sh shelves of Tylenol uh, medications. Um, and then obviously there are Johnson's baby products. And for those of us who um, start wearing contact lenses after the age of 40, um, Ecuvo uh, contact lenses are produced by Johnson & Johnson. Uh, market cap of Johnson & Johnson is um, almost $400 billion. Um, AstraZeneca. A uh, UK and a Swedish multinational company has come to prominence uh, because it has been nominated by UK government to manufacture and distribute the vaccine uh, which is originating from the OSI Oxford vaccine project. And again, to emphasize the Oxford vaccine, as opposed to many other COVID-19 vaccines will be uh, manufactured and distributed on a non-profit basis until um, the World Health Organization has taken COVID-19 off the global pandemic list uh, for 12 months. Uh, many of the other companies incidentally have already stated, particularly the US based ones, that they are intend to make significant profits from COVID-19 vaccine. Um, just an update on, on that vaccine project. Um, last week, there was a lot of media coverage in the UK media about the fact that they are now 80% confident that the vaccine will work. It will be a two-dose vaccine. It will be an annual vaccine. Um, and they're progressing very well. UK government, um, you know, has obviously first dibs on this vaccine, but the vaccine is also being tested in Brazil and in South Africa. And I'm hoping that the fact that uh, we are one of the test sites will give us some preferential access because United States has already given AstraZeneca $1.2 billion in order to secure primary access to that vaccine should it be successful. It's important to note that there will be more than one vaccine. More than one vaccine will be successful. Roche, another um, multinational company, Swiss-based, um, and which, which controls a number of other subsidiary companies, mostly involved in pharmaceuticals and diagnostics. Um, some very well-known, you know, medication that many of us could possibly be on right now, like Valium comes to, to mind. Tamiflu uh, as one of the treatments for COVID-19. Um, Rivetril um, as an alternative to Xenor. Um, so, so, and most importantly, everything to do with diabetes. So again, COVID touching onto, on, on one of the comorbidities of um, 
of uh, COVID-19 and the fact that I think, you know, diabetes has never been under as much spotlight as it is now. People who have been ignoring their condition are not ignoring their condition any longer. So, you know, Roche with AccuCheck and everything from treatment to diagnostics is in a very good position um, to benefit from that increased spotlight on diabetes as a COVID uh, comorbidity. But Roche has an enormous, enormous portfolio of drugs that it manufactures for different treatments, um, cancers, heart attacks, leukemias, cystic fibrosis. So it really is, is a giant in its field. A um, couple of others, Fitzer, which is a US multinational company, uh, which um, is focused on the development production of wide range of medicines, again, and vaccines, uh, particularly in immunology, immunology, oncology, cardiology sectors. Sorry, this is where my second uh, language, English, comes into play. But again, they've got some um, very no well-known brand name medication, um, Deflucan for the ladies and Viagra for the men, or for the ladies as well, I guess. And then, um, you know, market cap of, of Bitsa, 200 billion US dollars. I mean, it just dwarfs anything that we see on the JSC. And again, uh, as Nikki mentioned, Pizza is involved in testing of four different coronavirus vaccines. And based on its results, uh, it went into phase three trials. So that is where you have a lot of people that are being injected with the vaccine. Um, they are confident that they will be able to deliver millions of doses of the vaccine um, by October. So the Oxford project is not the only vaccine project out there. Moderna is using a very different technology, so it's probably kind of the newest uh, pharmaceutical group um, information. Its market cap has absolutely skyrocketed um, on the back of the COVID-19 vaccine that it is developing, and it's using a very different technology and methodology to the vaccine development to all the other companies. So it might be successful, it might not be successful. So with Moderna, you, you want to observe this. This was one of the most successful IPOs in the US in, in the biotech space of all, all times. Um, when they listed in 2018 at a valuation of 7.5 billion, but the company has shot up to a valuation of $28 billion purely on the, on the possibility that it will be able to produce a COVID-19 vaccine. Now, you know, the important thing about the COVID-19 vaccine, of course, is that in all these cases and with all these companies, the uh, general theme is that this will be an annual vaccine. So this is, uh, you know, annuity income stream for all of those companies, for the companies that are successful in the space. And then Thermo Fisher, yet another company, um, which is involved in the provision of scientific instruments and consumables, software, and other services to, to the healthcare industry. Uh, and its main product has to do with advanced DNA sequencing services and pro uh, bioprocessing technologies. Again, um, in March 2020, Tama Fisher received um, FDA's um, emergency authorization to develop a test for COVID-19. Um, so as you can see, you know, the, the things that you are exposed to from an investment perspective, but as well as, you know, just, just general knowledge perspective of um, what is out there in this field through this fund is enormous. And it's, it's themes that are just not spoken about in South Africa and not available to, to South African investors. And then on to my favorite topic, which is just touching on Oxford Sciences Innovation as a company. So Oxford Sciences Innovation, for those that haven't heard my, my spiel on this before, uh, was launched in 2015 in response to the fact that um, in the United States, uh, there is a very vibrant venture capital seen with a lot of very, very large venture capital companies, which literally sit like vultures around universities such as Stanford or MIT or Harvard. And any IP that originates from those universities that is worthwhile is almost immediately pounced upon by the VC firms and is commercialized and companies are born. Um, the same thing was not happening in the UK. 
And in 2015, some of the leading asset managers um, in, in Britain approached Oxford University, which is rated as the number one research university in the world and number one research, uh, research in medicine university in the world and proposed a deal to them where they would form a company, OSI, they would inject 600 and eight million dollar uh, million pounds into the company in terms of permanent capital and um, that capital would be deployed to commercialize ip or patents uh, which originate from the university of oxford so if a particular academic is working on a particular device or a particular way of testing for something new um, OSI gets first dibs on commercializing that IP and turning it into a commercial venture, a company, and a company that in time will generate revenues. Um, it is an exclusive relationship. And effectively, you know, the, the way it works at the moment and the percentage might, to, percentages might shift a little bit in, in future, it doesn't really shift the economics that much. But, you know, right now in an example where an academic you know, would own 50% of the IP of what they've developed and Oxford University would own 50%. With OSI coming on the scene, if a company is formed, the uh, Oxford University splits its stake in that IP 50-50 between itself and OSI. So OSI, by definition in this 50-50 example, basically owns 25% of the IP. Um, of, of that particular spin out. That agreement with Oxford University is 15 years in duration with an option to renew for another 15 years and then in perpetuity. So there is not another company that can come and strike a similar exclusive deal with Oxford University and OSI has NDAs, non-disclosure agreements with every department at Oxford. So you really have unique access to over 12,000 academics, as well as to the to over 700 million in R&D spent that Oxford spends on research and development. OSI itself in the last five years since its, its formation has spun out 80 different companies. It has sold a couple in that process and it aims to spin out and create 10 new companies every single year. Uh, to date, it has deployed less than half of the capital that was raised in June 2015. So as you, you can see, OSI doesn't need to raise cash um, and it won't raise cash. Shares in OSI were very tightly held by that group of initial asset managers who formed OSI. Um, but last year, in line with that move of money, you know, leaving active space and moving into passive strategies, um, there were some active asset managers in the UK who came under pressure uh, to, to, uh, in terms of outflows and they had to sell whatever they had in their portfolios and that created an opportunity for us to form funds and uh, buy OSI shares and some of those OSI shares have been allocated to this portfolio. So as I mentioned, Oxford University is the number one research university in the world, but most importantly, it is focused on life sciences. And, you know, one of the major life sciences is really the medical science division. Um, and I love the slide because it talks to the economics that OSI has created and synergies that OSI has created for Oxford. More companies have been spun out of Oxford since the formation of OSI five years ago than in the prior 700 years of the existence of Oxford University. So OSI is meant to be not a monopoly on Oxford, but rather a win-win for Oxford and for OSI shareholders, as well as importantly for the academic staff whose IP is being commercialized. So it's very important that the academic staff benefits from this commercialization. And I'll just touch on a couple of companies, so a few companies in, in this portfolio. Um, one is Evox, um, which uh, you know is exciting because OSI still owns 45% of the company. Uh, it was spun out of Oxford in 2016, and basically Evox has developed a way of targeted drug delivery. So using exosomes to facilitate a 
targeted drug delivery as opposed to the very crude way of delivering drugs by swallowing a pill which then has to dissolve and then has to you know flow through various organs and systems and veins before it actually reaches its uh, final point of destination most importantly just to ex give you an example of how big these spin outs could get in 2020 during the pandemic Evox entered into a strategic partnership with Japan's largest pharmaceutical company, Takeda, which is included in our portfolio. And Takeda has agreed to inject uh, over time on achievement of milestones, $882 million into Evox. Um, later that year, or later this year, Evox entered into a similar research co collaboration and license agreement with Eli Lilly, also in a fund. Uh, and Ellie Lilly has agreed to um, inject $1.2 billion into Evox. So, so there is this very kind of, you know, synergistic um, ecosystem around healthcare, healthcare provision, pharmaceutical companies, research companies, spin out companies and innovation. Osle, point of care device. So um, Osle it is a company which has developed a machine, which genuinely, it's not a fraud, genuinely can test for any number of diseases using a drop of blood. It is currently working on a COVID-19 test, both test for COVID as well as an antibody test. Um, and it believes that it will be able to deliver very, very rapid point of care testing for COVID-19 you know, within the next few months. Um, the company is currently doing a fundraise, but uh, at its last valuation, um, you know, after, after the last uh, uh, capital raise, Osler was valued at 100 million pounds. And this is a, a company which spun out of Oxford in 2016. Altromics, this talks to artificial intelligence. So uh, for all the gentlemen listening, uh, Connery, uh, or heart disease is the biggest killer of men over the age of 40. And um, the one way of diagnosing you know, heart disease is using ultrasound, which is nothing more than an X-ray of your heart. And um, effectively it relies on your doctor eyeballing this black and white image and diagnosing whether you have heart disease or not. Um, Altromics has developed a technology driven by artificial intelligence which uses 80,000 data points um, and it can diagnose, you know, whether there's something wrong with your heart or not in a few minutes. It reduces the error rate of, diagno of diagnostics by 50% and improves the um, accuracy of the diagnosis from 80% to 95%. And again, OSI owns 51% of Altromics. And then obviously the, the Oxford vaccine project, I've already mentioned, not for profit. It, Oxford does not want to be seen to profit from the vaccine, but the results are very, very positive. And, you know, there is no reason to believe that this vaccine will not be successful. So, you know, that really brings me to the last slide of this presentation. And then I will answer and take some of the questions that I have already seen coming up on the screen. And there are some real gems there, so I can't wait to answer a few of them. So why would you review your investment strategy right now? I think that first of all, the positive market returns that you are seeing, even from the JSC, are masking very weak economic and comp corporate fundamentals globally. So what you are seeing is you are seeing the deployment of massive amounts of quantitative easing, or for want of a better word, money printing. Money is being printed and thrown at anything in the markets, irrespective of whether the fundamentals of the corporates concerned really deserve um, that, that investment to be made. Um, you know, we have seen record levels of kind of earnings downgrades, losses being declared by companies, and yet the sentiment which is fueling and that free cash which is fueling the equity markets, you know, it's, it's not something that can really, really be seen as sustainable. In the US context, most of those gains in equities are not coming from a broadly diversified uh, basket of shares, but mostly from the tech companies, your Amazons, your Facebooks, your Googles, your Microsofts. Um, you know, it's not a surprise that US Congress held a hearing last week, um, taking some of those 
companies to task to the extent that they can be taken to task in terms of their market monopoly and dominance. Um, we do believe that management fees um, are key to your final investment outcome. Um, and hence, you know, again, living through a pandemic, when budgets are tight, even if you are not affected, I'm quite sure you have family members who have been affected by what has happened and everyone is helping out everyone else. I think, you know, you know exactly what, what I'm referring to. Management to fees you pay on your savings are key. Uh, minimize your fees. I think that we have an opportunity and a unique opportunity to benefit from some mega trends happening in the world. Healthcare being one of them, life sciences, renewable energy. Um, all of it is, as I've mentioned before, attracting grant funding. And then to the very touchy subject of taxation. So, you know, very often people don't want to um, change the investment strategies because they don't want to crystallize their tax. Well, guess what? CGT is going up. Um, we know that SARS is looking for tax everywhere, absolutely everywhere. And increasing capital gains tax is the easiest way. I mean, it's income tax, capital gains tax. I doubt they'll touch VET at this point in time. So if you are going to rebase the base costs of your investments and pay CGT, now is not the worst time to do so before the, we have the new budget coming through with CGT being at a much higher level. Um, and hence, you know, that should not stop you from reviewing your investment strategy. So thank you very much for, for participating. There are a lot of questions. Um, I'm going to try and address as many of them as I possibly can. So let me jump quickly into those questions. There are a lot. Um, the questions I don't get to, we will distribute in uh, written format. So will the fund be available through a tax free savings account? Yes. There are two fee classes uh, in the fund. One includes a performance fee, lower basic fee. One includes um, a, is a flat fee and the one with the flat fee will be available within a tax free savings account. Unfortunately, you will not be able to invest in this fund at this stage through Easy Equities. Easy Equities provides access to exchange traded funds only. This is a unit trust, so it's available on our platform. But, um, you know, we are looking at making it available as an ETF as well in the next iteration. Um, this is my favorite. Will the fund ex have exposure to marijuana medical industry? Immediately brought to mind Kosazana Zuma explaining to everyone in South Africa what a Zol was. Um, I don't think so. You know, I, I don't think that marijuana companies at this stage are in the top 150 pharmaceutical companies in the world. But, you know, who knows? We might all need this post COVID 19 or just to get through this pandemic if it lasts too long and a vaccine has not been developed. Uh, what is the overlap uh, between this fund and um, Signia? Um, both the MSCI World Index Fund, SAP 500 Fund, and the Fourth Industrial Revolution Fund. You know, there is some overlap in the large companies, uh, but this fund has, but not as much of an overlap as, as uh, you might think. Obviously, some of the very large um, the pharmaceutical companies are included in SAP 500 index tracking fund. They are included in the MSCI World Index Tracking Fund, but there are a lot of companies in the top 50 that don't feature in any of these funds. And you have seen that performance slide, which shows that the healthcare sector and this index has outperformed the MSCI World Index. Um, how will NHI affect the investment? Uh, you know, we don't believe, look, yeah, NHI. Um, we don't have ma enough money to cope with COVID-19 crisis. We are busy borrowing from IMF um, and scrapping from, from every bit of revenue we can find. To roll out NHI would take an enormous budget. We have no money. South Africa is bankrupt. These are vanity political slogans that are being used at the moment. You know, I truly believe that. Um, so I don't think that we, we really have to worry about NHI anytime soon. Um, what is the correlation between this fund for the industrial level? As I mentioned, there's very little overlap, actually. There's greater overlap between this fund and MSCI World or SAP 500 than Fourth Industrial Revolution Fund. Fourth Industrial Revolution Fund is very tech-driven um, fund. 
Um, we've mentioned the, the ESG rating. Um, healthcare industry is a massive capital investment industry. What time horizon is placed as is capital outlay you expect for investors investing in such a fund? Uh, duplication would be too easy. Uh, look, it, healthcare industry is a massively capital intensive industry. And that is why when investing in healthcare, you want to invest in well capitalized companies and in large companies. You don't want to invest in companies which struggle to raise capital for R&D. And that is what I think makes this fund so attractive, that you are investing in the giants of the industry, which are deploying enormous amount of capital on an annual basis to stay ahead of their competitors in the R&D game, but not only in terms of R&D, they're also deploying massive amounts of capital to buy out startups and buy out other companies and consolidate so that the portfolio, for instance, diagnostic machines or the portfolio of drug patents grows. So you want to be in this sector, you want to be with the giants. Um, you know, there's a question about uh, liquidity and valuation of OSI fund itself. It's not particularly, you know, it's not that relevant to, to, to this presentation other than how are OSI shares valued. Um, OSI itself um, values its portfolio of companies very conservatively once a quarter and releases the valuation of their share um, publicly to its shareholders. Um, apart from that, there are some transactions that happen in, in OSI shares. They have become very scarce. They used to be more active. It's obviously that market has dried up because everyone wants um, to buy OSI shares. Um, but, um, you know, we, we value the OSI shares at the latest trade that would have occurred in open market if there is a trade. And if there hasn't been a trade, uh, then we use OSI's own independent valuation of its share price. Um, and then Signia provides the liquidity um, to, to the um, holders of um, OSI shares through the Signia OSI fund. Um, and the reason we are able to provide that liquidity is that I promise you, demand outstrips supply massively. So, you know, the Signia OSI fund is not going to stay open for a lot longer. Um, unfortunately, we have had a lot of demand. We've also had international press coverage, which has meant that uh, we have international investors wanting to invest. And of course, you know, the moment you start looking at international investors, it's not rents, it's dollars, and the amounts get silly. Um, so, so we do have to, to be very cognizant of the fact that it's not, um, it's a scarce resource and we don't want to, to make promises we cannot meet. Um, as I mentioned, we will look at making this fund available as an exchange traded fund. Could, I know that Discovery, by talking to virtual medicine, Discovery has been trying to, to lobby government for change in legislation to facilitate virtual medicine. Um, I have also engaged um, because it is something that interests me particularly. I think not so much from you know a huge commercial perspective but it's something that uh, interests me from in terms of delivery of healthcare provision to the poor sectors of our of our population so imagine if you could have um, you know a mobile clinic and a virtual doctor in a mobile clinic going into a township um, you know you, you could eliminate queues um, you could eliminate the need for doctors to to be physically present in clinics to, to write out prescriptions. That's a piece of legislation we need to get changed, the physical presence of a doctor in writing out a prescription. But I do believe that this pandemic will accelerate potential change to that legislation. Um, huh, interesting, on ESG, how do you deal with companies that have the cure but will only release the drug at massive costs? Um, I think we will look at, look, if very interesting question because this is a question which touches directly on profiteering versus um, human misery. And um, I think we will avoid companies where the profiteering is blatant. So, you know, if, if there's a complete monopoly on the cure, obviously that company can set its own price. We don't believe that there will be only one vaccine available. We do believe that there are over 140 different vaccine projects on the go at the moment. So there will be choice in terms of 
vaccines and consequently there will be choice in terms of which companies you invest with and those that have already proclaimed their profiteering intentions would be screened out you know to 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 actually to, to make a small profit from a global pandemic fair enough um, to make a massive markup on a global pandemic talks to controversies and it, it just doesn't sit well. I don't think it sits well with anybody. Um, only a 3% allocation to our SAI fund with its massive upside potential, why not more? We don't have enough shares. So um, we have allocated, um, you know, the, the Signia OSI fund, there's a dedicated Signia OSI fund. So if you do want exposure, greater exposure than 3% to OSI, then just marry this fund with an investment in the Signia OSI fund. Um, you know, clearly there is a limit to, to how many OSI shares there are. Um, we believe we've bought up as many blocks of those shares as we could get our hands on. Um, we invest in, in uh, uh, Bravos funds and the Bravos funds themselves are the largest shareholder in OSI at the moment with 18.2% of the shareholding, but there are no sellers at this stage. So I think we flushed out all the sellers of OSI shares and obviously all the publicity that OSI has gained. Um, a lot of that publicity has come from South Africa, but uh, because of the publicity in South Africa, it has also reached US. Um, it has reached the Wall Street Journal. Um, it has were reached Financial Times. So there are a lot of investors looking and, and looking at OSI and looking for shares. Um, we were very fortuitous and obviously we did not envisage a pandemic. Uh, I just thought it was a massively, massively attracting, attractive investment opportunity when we invested in 2019 uh, before the pandemic. Um, um, is it a passive? So, so the Unitrust version is not a passive index tracking fund. It has, it's more of a dynamic passive index tracking fund in the sense that we have all these screens that we have imposed on top of an index and we have developed our own index as opposed to tracking the MSCI, uh, the healthcare sector index, the official index. In terms of launching an ETF, in terms of JSC rules, we would have to either get our index, which we have developed through our own methodologies, um, calculated by an external third party, which typically adds to the cost, which we don't like, but we will probably go that route. So we will basically take our methodology, ask an external provider to calculate that index for us, and then we can launch that, that fund as an ETF. So JSC requires you to have an independent index calculator. Um, providing the actual index, so you can't customize your own indices. Will the fund be available on standard bank platform? Um, again, it's not an ETF. Um, if you're talking about the LISP platform, you know, the, the various LISP platforms uh, respond to uh, investor demand. So they make the funds available. Obviously, there are a lot of unit trusts available in South Africa, and uh, most LISPs um, respond to, if, if there are queries asking to invest in a particular fund. Like, you know, we've got a lot of inquiries um, for the fourth industrial revolution fund. The different uh, companies will make those funds available on their platforms. So please ask Standard Bank or alternatively just come to Signia platform. Um, if you invest via the Signia platform, we don't charge any platform fees. So the only fee that you pay is the management fee that you pay on the unit trust itself. I know it doesn't mean that you get this beautiful consolidated investment statement from one provider, but at least you're not paying any fees for that consolidated fund. Um, will the healthcare innovation fourth industrial be available on Signia offshore pet platform? Um, yes, so, so what we are doing is we are converting, you know, the fourth industrial revolution fund um, and healthcare innovation fund will join it into feeder funds in South Africa. So you will have an equivalent mirror fund offshore where you will be able to invest in that unit trust directly offshore using any money that you have offshore. So that's coming. Um, you know, it should have been in place already. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has been that regulate, regulators um, worldwide has gone, have gone into slow mode. Uh, so all registrations are taking much longer than we would have um, 
um, liked. Um, is there any intention to include any other unlisted investments in the fund besides OSI? Yes. So if we come across something really attractive, obviously we are governed by Cisca limits, but if we come across something incredibly innovative, um, we will include it in the fund directly. Um, you know, there's absolutely no reason not to, but it will be within, within the Cisca limits on what, what is permitted to, you know, in, in understood investments within a unit trust. The difference between A and B funds, fees, management fees. You've got a choice of paying a flat fee uh, of 0.8% per annum, including VAT. I think it's excluding VAT, or 0.7% per annum plus a 10% performance fee um, if you include in the performance fee um, category uh, or, or series of the fund. Um, then is there any overlap of, of address, percentage of listed versus unlisted? At the moment, the unlisted is only the 3% in OSI, but it might um, go a little bit higher. Johnson & Johnson had had some negative legal cases against it in terms of the baby product, baby formula, baby powder sold in Africa, absolutely, uh, and asbestos in their products. Um, look, what needs to be a little bit pragmatic in terms of um, the, the ESG screening. Um, I think the negative cases you talk, you're talking about with Johnson & Johnson are historical in nature, and I think they've taken remedial action to deal with some of the negative issues. Um, but when you look at the pharmaceutical space, you know, you will find that um, there are many companies that have had bad publicity in the past. Um, so it's unavoidable. What you want to avoid is companies which are currently dealing with you know, negative issues and not addressing them or have not historically addressed them if an issue came to the fore. Um, otherwise, you are likely to have um, you know, screened out every single big pharma company that you could invest in. Um, through which signal investment, all our wrappers. So um, the fund is available through the retirement annuities, living annuities, preservation funds, as a direct investment, tax-free savings accounts, debit orders, lump sums. And I think the minimum entry point would be, but I could be making this up, 5,000 rand, but it might be lower. So please check on the fund fact sheet that will be made available on, on the website. Um, does the fund include Gilead? It does um, include Gilead, which, which uh, is working on, or at least where the treatment that remedies for, sorry, my Polish would be better than my English in, in pronunciation of these medical names. Why can't they make medical drug names easy? Does it really have to be a string of letters that are completely unpronounceable uh, to most people? Um, so yes, it does include Gilead. Um, let me just take a couple more uh, questions um, and then we'll address others in, in written form because, you know, it's, it's a stream of questions that I see. Um, an interesting question, what would be the long-term prospects for healthcare versus technology and what would be the appropriate long-term split between technology and healthcare? Look, I think there's a convergence of technology and healthcare to some extent. And, you know, if I was kind of, and I'm completely going to thumb suck it based on my own gut feel of what I'm seeing in, happening in the world. And this is a gut feel. So please don't take it as advice or recommendation. I would probably go with 60 to 70% split towards technology, 30, 40% split towards healthcare. That was a personal choice uh, based on, on gut feel. Um, and uh, let me just, sorry, I'll just scroll down. Let me take um, one more um, question or a couple more. What's your view on investment in cryptocurrencies? Don't ask me that question. I lost so much money on Bitcoin. I was right there, tulip mania. Um, and you would have thought that, um, you know, I would be, after 25 years in asset management industry, I completely bought into the concept that Bitcoin is digital gold. Um, and I lost a lot of money on that. I think it's a very, very intangible um, 
asset class, if you can call it such. Um, I, I fully believe in blockchain technology, by the way, and anything driven by blockchain technology. Bitcoin itself, the fact that it actually is nothing, it exi exists in ether. Um, after the amount of, I think it's, it, it will be hugely volatile. So if you're in for betting, then cryptocurrency is your game. But as a you know, long-term sensible investment strategy, not in my portfolio. Again, personal view. I'm sure there are some younger people listening to me and about to shoot me. Um, and have you seen an opportunity partner with help innovators in South Africa, similar to Oxford University? You know, it's something that I'm actually personally very interested in. I'm not sure that, you know, we have um, a signal. This is something we would look at, but it's certainly something that I want to look at in my personal um, space in, in terms of, you know, potentially um, putting my own capital into healthcare innovation in South Africa first, dipping my toes in the water. Certainly in terms of Signia OSI fund, interestingly enough, uh, without naming names, we already have some South African universities, retirement funds as clients who have opted to invest in the Signia OSI fund. Um, I do believe that there's healthcare innovation happening in, in South Africa. Um, one just needs to uncover it. And uh, given my newfound focus on healthcare, um, and maybe it comes late in life. You know, I've, um, my parents are medical doctors. I've always wanted to be a medical doctor, couldn't afford to study medicine, ended up studying actuarial science, which I don't understand to this day. Maybe this is the second iteration of my career is the ability to combine my investment expertise with healthcare provision. Um, so certainly looking into that space and seeing whether there is something that one can do in South Africa. And obviously if it's something that's appropriate for broader market, broader investors, we would bring it to you as, as our clients. Um, at the moment, as I mentioned, the fund is only available in South Africa, but we will make it available offshore as soon as the regulators start approving funds offshore and the fund is live and you can invest right now. Um, and um, I think that brings me to the end of the presentation. I know I haven't dealt with every single question, but there, there are lots and lots of questions. We'll try and address the rest of your questions um, in a written form, if possible. Otherwise, please email them and we will deal with, with the rest of the questions. Thank you so much. This has been a great audience. It has been a very large webinar uh, with a lot of participants. Um, so clearly there's a lot of interest in this. Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone and thank you for being a supporter of Signia. Thank you for being interested in what we do. We try to innovate, we try to be relevant, we try to bring the products to you at the lowest possible cost. And for those of you that haven't noticed, our funds generally, including our global balanced skeleton funds are the top performing funds in South Africa at the lowest possible fees. And that continues and remains, I promise to you as our investors. Once again, thank you very much and have a good day. Stay safe, everybody. Bye.